In this lesson, we're beginning to talk about logic and the different kinds of reasoning that we use. So a conjecture is a statement that is believed to be true. Um, another way that we refer to conjectures is as an educated guess. Now, some of you may be thinking that in science, you learned that an educated guess is called by a different name. That term is used differently in this class, and we'll get to that. So the two different kinds of reasoning that we use are inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. In inductive reasoning, you're observing patterns. So you notice things that have happened in the past, and you're going to use that to predict what's going to happen in the future. With deductive reasoning, you're using logic and facts and a sequence of steps to arrive at a conclusion that is true for all situations. I'll show you the difference. In this uh, explore of your text, we are completing the steps to make a conjecture about the sum of three consecutive counting numbers. You know what counting numbers are. The term consecutive means one right after the other. So it says write a sum to represent the first three consecutive counting numbers starting with one. So that's 1 plus 2 plus 3 equals 6. And they're saying, is the sum divisible by 3? Well, my sum was 6. And if I take 6 divided by 3 is 2. So yes. Write the sum of the next three consecutive starting number, uh, counting numbers starting with 2. 2 plus 3 plus 4 is 9. And then they're asking us the same question. Is that sum divisible by 3? So that means I'm checking whether 9 divides nicely by 3, and it does. So yes. And then it says complete the conjecture. The sum of three consecutive counting numbers is divisible by 3. Based on our observations, that seems like an educated guess. That is inductive reasoning. In deductive reasoning, we want to make sure that this is true in a more general sense. So before we get into that, a uh, little bit of vocabulary, you see that in this portion of your text, they are defining a theorem. And a theorem is a statement that can be proven. Remember that at the very beginning of our course, we were introduced to postulates. And postulates are terms that we just accept to be true, but we cannot prove them. A theorem can be proven. So now we're going to do the same thing as we did in the last screen but we're going to be more general. Um, so it says, let the three consecutive counting numbers be represented by n, n plus 1, and n plus 2. Those are three consecutive counting numbers. And if I add those three things together, what they've done is they've combined their like terms to get that 3n you see. So n plus n plus n is that 3n. And then I'm going to combine my remaining terms. 1 plus 2 is 3. And the expression 3n plus 3 that I arrived at in the last line can be factored as 3 times n plus 1. And since the expression 3 times n plus 1 is divisible by 3 for all values of n, finally at the end, they're saying, is the conjecture true or false? Is my conjecture that the sum of three consecutive counting numbers is divisible by true by three true? And yes, it is. I've just proven it using deductive reasoning. Uh, 
I mentioned earlier that the term hypothesis, well, I didn't mention it by name, but you knew what I was talking about, that the term hypothesis is used to describe something different in this class. It's used to describe a part of a conditional statement. So on your screen and in your text, you see that a conditional statement is a statement that can be written as if something, then something. Your text describes it as if P, then Q. The if part, without the word if, is the hypothesis. And the then part, without the word then, is the conclusion. So notice in the example that they're given, when I have the if 3x minus 5 equals 13, then x equals 6, the hypothesis is that 3x minus 5 equals 13, and that my conclusion is therefore x equals 6. In this grid, you see some properties that you've seen before in Algebra 1. The first four are what you use to solve most of your equations. Whatever you do to one side, you do to the other. That's what those properties are saying. Reflexive property, I have the same thing on each side of the equal sign. Symmetric property allows me to flip an equation around. Transitive property allows me to take two equations that have a common side of the equation and kind of smush it down to one. So let me clarify what I mean by that. In the transitive property, I have that A equals B and B equals C. Well, since this B is the same in those two equations, I can smush those two equations down to one and just say that A equals C. Substitution property just allows me to take one value and substitute it in for another when those two values are equal. So we're asked in this example to use deductive reasoning to solve the equation. And using deductive reasoning means that you are justifying, you're giving a reason for every step of your process. Okay? But it's not a difficult process as we're starting out here. You've solved equations like this before. Okay? So when you were solving equations in algebra last year, and you had an equation that looks like this, your objective, remember, was to get x by itself. So since my x is on the right-hand side of the equation, and I've got that 17 minus the 4x, first thing I want to do is get rid of that positive 17. So since there's addition slash subtraction going on here, I want to cancel that positive 17 out by subtracting it from both sides. So when I do that, I will have that 9 minus 17 equals negative 4x. Because I am subtracting something from both sides, I'm using the subtraction property of equality. And then in the next step, I'm just going to combine these like terms and get negative 8. And if you want to write a reason for that, just so that you know what we did for your own purposes, you can say combine like terms. If you were solving this equation in algebra last year, your next step would be to divide both sides by that negative 4. And since I'm dividing something from both sides, I'm using the division property. And I get 2. But of course, a lot of people are really, really happy when the x is on the left and the number is on the right. So I'm just going to switch that equation around and write it as x equals 2 instead of 2 equals x, and that's the symmetric property. It's very, very frequently confused with reflexive. Reflexive property, however, be careful. Reflexive property has the exact same thing on both sides of the equal sign. Exact.
Take this moment and work through the your turn below. Your instructions are to write that statement as a conditional. Your answer should be if something, then something. In addition, in this lesson, we're starting to talk about some of the properties of segments and angles. In algebra or even in middle school, at some point, you were taught that when two angles add up to 180 degrees, we call them supplementary angles. There's various special supplementary angles, and we're being introduced to one of them now, a linear pair is a pair of adjacent angles whose non-common sides are opposite rays. So let's make sure that we're speaking the same language. There's quite a bit of vocabulary in this definition. So a linear pair is a pair of adjacent angles. Let's stop there. Adjacent just means next to each other in plain old English. Adjacent angles are next to each other. In geometry, adjacent angles are sharing a common side like angles 1 and 2 are adjacent. However, I want to make sure to make this point. Angle 1 and angle ABC are not adjacent. Notice that angle 1 isn't quote unquote next to angle ABC, it's inside of angle ABC. They're not adjacent angles. Okay, so I wanted to make sure to clarify that vocabulary. So their common side in these adjacent angles would be ray BD. And then coming back to the linear pair definition, if I throw some letters on here, that might help clarify a few things. So let's make this W, X, Y, and Z using the vocabulary that I was talking about before when I was describing adjacent angles to you, angles 3 and 4 in this diagram are adjacent angles. Their common side, the side that is an angle, the, the ray that is a side of both angles is this one. This is the common ray common side. Their non-common sides are what's being described in the definition of the linear pair. Their non-common sides are WZ and WX. They are opposite rays. Let me make sure to clarify that as well. Opposite rays are collinear, meaning they're on the same line, remember. They are collinear, having the same endpoint. going in opposite directions. Okay, so I wanted to make sure to clarify some of that vocabulary about what a linear pair looks like. And now look at the diagram. 
notice that angle XWZ is a straight angle. Straight angle is 180 degrees. And since angles three and four are part of that straight angle, it should just make sense that angles three and four add up to 180 degrees. So some of you may be thinking, well, that's really a well duh kind of thing. So why is that a theorem? Why isn't it a postulate? Well, it's a theorem because it can be proven. If you follow that sequence of steps that I went through with you verbally, I was basically proving the linear pair theorem. In this figure, we are given that angle RST, notice at the very top, we are given that the measure of angle RST equals 15x minus 10. Before I go on, notice that this is part B of example two, which means that there's a part A to go along with it in your text. So perhaps you wanna pause the video before I go over this one and look at what they did in the textbook for part A. What I do have is two parts of an angle adding up to a larger whole angle. So that's the angle addition postulate. And remember, angle addition postulate says part plus part equals whole, or the way the book has the blanks set up for us, whole equals part plus part. So the whole angle is angle RST. The two parts of it are angle RSP and angle PST. And the textbook doesn't have um, blanks for us to fill in on the right-hand side. But I think it's a good idea for us to be in the practice of doing so. So in the next step, when I substitute the values that they've given us for the measures of the angles that we're using, you might want to write down substitution so that when you are doing proofs like this on your own and you have to provide a reason for it, you know what that reason is. So they substituted in 15x minus 10 for the measure of angle RST. I can substitute in for RSP, x plus 25. And for PST, I can substitute 5x plus 10. And then, once again, remember your algebra. If this was just an algebra equation from last year that you were asked to solve, the next thing that you would do would be to combine like terms. So let's do that. On the right-hand side, my like terms combine to 6x plus 35. And I'm going to write down combine like terms. Again, if you were in algebra, the next thing that you would do would be to use to get the x's together and get the loose numbers together. The book does it all in one step. Some of you may prefer to do it in two. Either way, you'll end up with 9x equals 45. And both addition and subtraction were used here. And then finally, the last thing I have to do to get x by itself is divide both sides by 9 so that x equals 5. And that's the division property. And that is your first proof of the year.
We are also looking at some properties of points, lines, and planes. They are postulates, so they can't be proven. And you'll notice they're all pretty basic stuff. If I have two points, there's only going to be one line passing through them. Because in this form of geometry, the only kind of lines that exist are straight lines. We're saying line, we assume we mean a straight line. If I have three non-collinear points, that's three points not in the same line, remember, then there's exactly one plane containing them, which is why when we name a plane, we use three non-collinear points. Uh, if two points lie in a plane, then the line containing those points also lies in the plane. If two lines intersect, their intersection is one point. And if two planes intersect, then their intersection is exactly one line. In this example, we have two planes intersecting, and we're being asked to label or name some figures out of this diagram. Once again, notice that this is a part B for example three, which means that there's an example A in your text. You may want to pause the video and look at part A, which they've done for you, before I do part B. So the first figure that's described is the line of intersection of two planes. Remember, when two planes intersect, their intersection is a line. And these two planes are intersecting at line FG. This is the line at which those two planes intersect. Remember, use the arrowheads to indicate that it is a line. There are two lines in this plane, in this diagram, line M and line L, and they are intersecting. I've already drawn line FG for you. If I draw line L, you should see that they are intersecting at point J. We're being asked for three coplanar points. Well, any three points will be coplanar, so you could pick points H, J, and F. You could pick points H, J, and G. You could even pick the three points that are on the same line. I would like you to notice points H, J, and F. because they are all on this plane here. And seeing things three-dimensionally is often a struggle for students. It takes getting used to. Finally, we're being asked for three collinear points. Remember, collinear points are three points that are all on the same line, and that's points F, J and G. 